Hello, my name is Sean Matsunaga, and I'm doing my presentation on Hanauma Bay, The Sands of Time. First, a brief history of Hanauma Bay. Hanauma Bay is made up of the molten ash that settled and hardened during a series of violent explosions 32,000 years ago. Hydromagmatic blasts occurred when a volcanic vent opened up underwater. This eruption blew up steam, hot gases, coral, rock, and fine ash covering the area. The ash chemically cemented together over time to create the tough cone. A rise in sea level and wave erosion is the reason for the break in the cone, which filled with ocean water to create Hanauma Bay. At the Education Center, there were examples of the types of rocks that you will find at Hanauma Bay. I saw and felt the difference between a basaltic rock and a lava rock and also experienced the texture and weight of coral and tuff as well. In this photo, the lava rock on the left is light in weight and porous as compared to the basaltic rock on the right, which is more dense and solid. The reason for this is due to the amount of gas bubbles trapped and cooled in volcanic rocks. Basalt, which is the most common form of volcanic rock in Hawaii, is heavier, fine-grained, harder, and prized by the Hawaiians for use in tools and weapons. The next photo shows a piece of coral, which was once part of a living coral reef, also called limestone or calcium bicarbonate. While the outside is a thin layer of living tissue, it leaves a hard calcium bicarbonate skeleton as it grows. In this photo, you can see what tuff looks like. Remember, tuff is the volcanic ash that hardened due to a natural cementing process. This is what Hanauma Bay is made of, and you can see the fragments of basalt and coral embedded into the tuff, which has a resemblance to sandstone. Prior to the year of 1956, Hanauma Bay had already become one of the favorite fishing and picnicking parks for the people of Hawaii. Swimming, however, was a different story, as there were only two natural lagoons present at the north end of the bay, as it was surrounded by a nearly unbroken chain of shallow reef along the shoreline. <laughs> In the year of 1956, the city and county of Honolulu had sold an easement through the bay to the Hawaiian Telephone Company for the first leg of a new Trans-Pacific Undersea Telephone Cable. Hawaiian Dredging was the contractor who blew a 200-foot wide strip through the reef. There were tons of coral rocks that were removed and oil covered the water. All it took was a few days to destroy the central portion of Hanauma's fringing reef and some of the reef beyond. With so much devastation comes a ray of sunlight, as a new biological zone was created inside the reef. The loose rubble left by the blasting became a habitat for a host of small invertebrates and fishes who feed on them, many of which had not lived inside the reef in numbers prior to the blast. They now had ample living space, and the channel provided a way in and out, as well as improving the circulation inside the reef. Today, there are quite a few species that occur in the artificial swimming area that normally do not occur in sandy bottom lagoons. There were two recorded sand restoration projects, one in 1970 and another in 1987. In 1970, the city and county of Honolulu imports sand to build a wave barrier on the reef crests to close the 1956 cable trench and restore the beach. The sand origin is unknown. In 1987, 3,500 cubic yards of sand was imported from Kahuku, Oahu to restore the beach due to beach erosion. In the 
following photos, you will see the sights that I saw on my way down to Hanauma Bay. These photos were taken from the north end of the bay. The bay surrounding walls are made of tuff. If you take a closer look, you can see the fragments of basalt and coral embedded in the tuff. Here you can see the sand is very fine with grains of basalt, coral and shells of various sea creatures. As you travel in the opposite direction to the other side of the bay, the scenery changes a bit. If you look behind you, you will see a view of Coco Crater. Here you will see that the sand texture changes and becomes more coarse, as the particles of sand have larger pieces of basalt, coral, and other sediments. The sand color is not as bright as it was on the other side of the bay, but has a dull color to it. There also seems to be a dividing line in the sand as the sand closer to the shore is coarse and suddenly met by fine textured sand. In this close-up photo, you can see the changes in texture and size of the sand particles. As you explore to the far end of the bay, it almost seems like you're on a deserted island somewhere, as it is completely different from the other end. There are large chunks of rock and coral scattered everywhere, mixed in with other debris such as driftwood and other green waste. It seems as if everything gets washed ashore on this side of the bay. If you look closely, you can see the debris in the water. I also found a small portion of the shoreline that had a light film of oil-like substance on the surface of the water. Like everything else, it will also wash ashore in time. An up-close look at the sand reveals a significant amount of olivine present in the sand, as confirmed with the personnel at the Education Center. These are just some of the things that I found scattered along the shoreline. This photo looks like strands of rope and plastic or some type of lanyard woven into various types of debris. Another, another photo shows more of the mixed debris. I found a half-eaten coconut. And in this photo, a collector urchin meets his fate as it is attacked by an unknown species of beach flies. A Colea golden plover is keeping a watchful eye as it is on the hunt for food. Other facts about sand? The Sand Maker, starring parrotfish or uhu. If you go snorkeling at Hanama Bay and hear a crunching noise, you might want to see if there's an uhu or parrotfish nearby. They have beak-like teeth and modified bones in the back of their throat that crush any rock or coral that they ingest. Their beaks are used to scrape algae from coral and rocks as their diet consists of algae and coral polyps. The parrotfish ingest a large amount of coral per year and in turn what comes out is sand. One large parrotfish is capable of generating over a ton of sand per year and as a whole species, are responsible for the output of over a billion tons of sand per year. It was once thought that parrotfish were destroying the reefs, but later it was found that the parrotfish actually promote a healthy reef by preventing algae from smothering the reef. It is no surprise that parrotfish can be found in other tropical places known for their beaches, such as the Bahamas, throughout the Caribbean, Florida, and the eastern and western boundaries of the Gulf of Mexico. Well, I hope you enjoyed learning about Hanauma Bay as much as I did. I thank you for your time and attention and hope that you will make a trip to Hanauma Bay and experience it for yourself.